Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is John Corras Mons. I'm the CEO of Wondo Mobility. We are an urban mobility marketplace that provides access to multiple modes of transportation, both public and private. And our idea is to create a completely integrated and unique experience. We are part of Ferrovial Group, which is a global infrastructure operator. So today we have Nir Eres, the CEO of Movit. Nir is a good friend of both Ferrovial and Wondo because we've been working closely for more than two years now. Wondo and Movit are building together a fully integrated urban mobility experience in Spain and Portugal. And in the last year, our engineering and data teams have been developing the technology to bring taxi, car, moto sharing, bike sharing to the Movit app users. I have to say that I'm very impressed about Movit performance, but also about their technology and Nir's vision about urban mobility business. So prior to Movit, Nir was also the founder and CEO of both Action Base and Optimal Plus. And now let's do a short summary of Movit, which is one of the top mobility companies in the world. So Movit was founded in 2012 to help users navigate the complexity of public transit and today has helped more than 800 million users. I have to read this in 3,100 cities across 102 countries. And five weeks ago, it was acquired by Intel and Mobileye for $1 billion. So hello, Nir, welcome to the show. And of course, congratulations. Hello, thank you very much for the generous introduction. I'm very happy to be here. And as you said, we're great partners to both Ferrovial and Wondo. So I believe you are very happy personally because uh, these numbers are amazing, but also because it's very interesting for movies to be even more ambitious about what you can do about the future of mobility. So now with the help of Intel and Mobileye, you are kind of jumping to the next opportunity, which is autonomous driving technology. And what's Mobile, Mobile's Intel Mobileye vision of the urban mobility now? What's the main value proposition you are building together? So yeah, first we're, we're very excited and very happy. You know, if, if besides going a public company, if I had to think about a potential acquirer, uh, the top of the list for me would be Intel, uh, Intel and Mobileye, actually. And the reason for that is uh, the synergy and the potential of continue to move on and change the world was very attractive for us, besides, of course, the very generous uh, financial offer uh, to buy Movit. Um, first and before everything else, uh, the promise I got from uh, Intel CEO and, and Mobileye CEO, um, Professor Amnon Shashua, was that Movit will kept as a separate independent company fully owned by Intel. So we are going to keep operating the same way as we did before, working with Ferrovial, working with uh, other companies uh, that are partners like Microsoft and Uber and Apple and others. And that, that was very um, uh, important for us. But when we look at the future of mobility and the potential synergy between the companies, we see a situation where Intel and Mobileye decided to take a very important part of the future of mobility by developing the supply side. Uh, Mobileye is, is, is a technology, it's a self-driving car kit, but it's also going to be a service. And when this service uh, will provide vehicles that with different sizes that will be able to pick up and drop off people, uh, what they were looking for is the other side of it, which is the demand side. Understanding where people want to go and access these people and offer them the service. Because if you put 20,000 cars in a city and you don't have access to the uh, demand side, uh, you're missing the whole opportunity. And Movit, I think, provides uh, a clear um, visibility to where people want to go every morning. With our users, we see um, tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of monthly active users. And 
I think more more than a billion trillions every month where we understand how people move between one point to another. And we're going to connect it with the supply side that Intel will and Mobileye are going to provide very soon. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting to understand how Intel and Mobileye are thinking about approaching directly the final user. That's probably the most interesting part of your acquisition, right? The, the ecosystem will be much larger. It will include local operators. It will include uh, uh, maybe local brands that will support it. So there are multiple different business models. So how are we going to do it together? But eventually, we want to be a substantial player in this market moving forward and, and leading part, uh, uh, a leading um, company in this market moving forward for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. I, I listened to the to the conference call about the acquisition that was really interesting and the questions were really interesting and, and Amnon Shashua, the CEO of Mobileye, uh, explained that the autonomous driving technology roadmap and how Mobileye is planning to launch level four, which is fully autonomous but in a defined in a control area and and they are planning or you are planning to do in 2022 that's that's really here already absolutely we have already several uh, cities around the world that already approved it and we're working very hard to be ready on time together between mobile and movie okay that's that's really interesting so Changing a little bit the, the topic is, we, we could say that Israel is the top mobility tech ecosystem today. And why do you think is that? What are, in your opinion, the key reasons for, for that to happen? It's, it's, a, it's a very good question and it's very hard to give it a clear answer, but that's my personal opinion that uh, there's multiple components that makes Israel um, such a leader in this space. First is that our transit system is very uh, problematic. Like many other cities, congestion is, is very high and, and uh, the infrastructure of public transit is uh, not as good as many other uh, countries or cities around the world. So we're suffering from the problem. So the problem itself is very uh, intense and clear here. But I think it combines um, what people would call the, the startup nation components that includes um, a very high level of uh, entrepreneurship and, and ecosystem that drives entrepreneurship uh, to solve problems uh, in one hand. And, and the other thing is the fact that we are such a small country and we don't have a local market. So we always need to look at the global markets as our targets. And there's almost no way you can build a company to serve the local market. So if you can combine all these aspects of entrepreneurship ecosystem, a big problem, and the fact that we have to go global from day one, you see companies that build their products and, and, and their products and think about solving problems in a global way. And, you know, Movit is one of them, but, but Mobileye, of course, is, is an amazing example for that, and Waze was another one. So all of these companies have in common the entrepreneurship level and thinking global. Mm -hmm. That's really, it's, it's really interesting to see that many companies being acquired by big corporations and doing such as like very amazing stuff and, and technology. So I was now going back to, to mobility as a service. So we are both working on, together on, on mobility as a service opportunity. And basically the idea is that people, users, citizens in certain crowded areas like then cities, they have a real need in choosing the right transport mode for their trip. So most of the time, it's a multimodal trip that includes public transit, micromobility, or taxi. So in my opinion, I see like three big issues, and, and I want to know your opinion. So in, in my opinion, the three key issues around mobility as a service is, first is the marketplace, is how you combine and integrate different operators' payments in a single experience. So customer experience here is, is key if we want to replace the private car and also how to convince other companies to be part of these marketplaces, which is uh, something that is not easy because we need to convince them to have the same vision. Second, I think is data protection. So how we can create the framework where the user can decide with full transparency 
and how we share this data, this mobility data with public stakeholders, public transit, and be able to, to regulate accordingly because that's, that's it's a really big part here. Because the third point, it was local regulation. So what is going to be the role of municipalities, public transit operators in this transition into the mobility as a service value proposition? So in your opinion, what are the key issues we need to solve to fulfill this vision? Or, or if you have to choose only one big problem around mobility as a service, what will be? So I think you've mentioned that the, the challenges, and, and you're, you're very right about all the challenges, uh, and I'm not going to repeat it, but if I had to choose one, I would say that the, the actual cross-payment process would be the most challenging one because it involves with direct uh, regulatory decisions and, of course, with the local municipality uh, decisions in every city, payment is, is being built differently with different rules, mm. and it's very hard to unify it. But in the same time, if you think about what can make uh, a true multimodal trip from point A to point B uh, uh, smooth, it's, it's the ability to leave home and get to your destination using multiple modes of transportation, ride hailing, train, uh, micro, micro uh, mobility like scooters, and at the end of the month, get one bill for your whole transportation. And that's, that's the holy grail of, of uh, the mobility as a service future. And solving this problem would make things much easier because we are already taking care of, of connecting all the pieces. Uh, the hardest problem is the regulatory forces and the payments. We have just signed a very strategic agreement in the US with Cubic who responsible for 70% of the payment uh, for transit around the world. And we're putting together a platform that will be open to other payment companies to participate. And maybe there would be a solution for connecting all the different modes of payment uh, between different providers. It's, it's very important question. And it's always, all of the cities are doing it in a completely different way. So that's, the big problem that there are always many operators involved and, and a different solution in every place. So that, that's what we are facing also in, in, in Madrid, in Barcelona. So, and I think that this is true that this needs to be the first thing to solve. So together with the integration of all operators. And now uh, if I wanted also to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and to see what what is your opinion about that, what you think are the main trends. So I prepared this question before COVID-19, but I think it's interesting to understand uh, how the recovery from the pan pandemic is happening in different countries. So how did you go to your office this morning? Yeah, so personally, I'm still at home today. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> But usually I drive, uh, since my neighborhood doesn't have it, that's part of the Israeli problem of transportation, that doesn't have a bus access, so I drive a hybrid car to work. I work uh, a few miles from home. But going back to your question, I mean, we, we saw a huge dip in usage during the, the month of March and April uh, to a level of 80% deep worldwide. So 80% of, of people's movement completely stopped. Uh, we're starting to see the world coming back. I think we're about 60% back, 60 to 70% back regarding the number of trips we see on a daily basis. But it's very general. It's around the world. We can country by country, but people are starting to, to uh, move again. Uh, public transit systems are up again, and uh, we we see we see definitely that people are moving uh, back and commuting on a daily basis. Still not close to the level we were in end of February uh, this year. How do you think it's going to to impact remote working to mobility? So, do you think it's going to be a big impact or? Because we are, we have many discussion about this in 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 the team, in with all yeah. many stakeholders, and, it's, really and it's interesting. Yeah, it really depends on the industry. I mean, some industries can easily 
uh, adapt working remotely in many aspects without impact on productivity. But I think that what happened is the actually the, the biggest uh, real experiment in humans uh, in, in the history of, of, of the human being. I mean, we were forced not to travel and, and all of a sudden a lot of different methods became relevant to work remotely. Uh, as an anecdote, the acquisition deal of MoveIt from getting the LOI, starting the negotiation through the due diligence and closing and the announcement to employees happened without even one face-to-face -face meeting. I mean, we never met the guys that worked, you know, during the process. Some of them we've met years before, but what I'm trying to say is that the technology today, um, fortunately enough, allowed us to operate almost the same way we would operate uh, in regular days. But if you think about it, in some cases, even better, because everybody is available, they're at home, they're available 24-7, the, the time it takes you to get from a meeting to a meeting is five clicks <laughs> instead of getting into, you know, going to a different off, uh, office or something. So it was, I would even say carefully more efficient than if we, if we had to do it face-to-face. Uh, -face. We had to fly to California and fly back. And so I think that we will see um, different areas of business changing that travel will be even when everything will be open, travel will be considered again before we spend money and time on, on long distance flights. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, I don't think that we could eliminate completely the, the interpersonal relationship by meeting people face to face, at least initially. And then when you know people now, I know you because we've met multiple times. So I feel very comfortable to talk to you. But I think the importance of, of, of human interaction is still uh, relevant. It will change the way we travel, but at the end of the day, it will not eliminate uh, the real physical interaction. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely agree. I, I read uh, an interesting research like a couple of weeks ago explaining that that even when people is working remotely, they they move to other things. So they the mobility is not going to is going to change, but it's not going to stop because in the end, people that are working yeah. remotely, they go to the schools to bring their children to the school. Uh, they go to buy more on physical stores because they have a, more time to move. So in the end, the people is move, it's still moving uh, at the same time. So they, they say that, that we, we are going to, or we are moving like an hour per day or something like that. And we'll be moving an hour per day, even if we are working at home. So that's interesting because I think that mobility is going to be important mobility is going to be there but it's going to be different so that's that's the the idea it's like the the to understand what are going to be the trends right to to see because yeah. i'm i'm following like these days many many cases of startups in in europe in in the states that are changing really fast to adapt their products their services to to the new needs after covid19 and some of them are being very, very successful. So, so we ourselves, we are seeing that, that, that we can close closer, we can work closer to public transit because uh, they are digitalizing some of the systems faster than before. So, so things are, are accelerating in, in all digital uh, transformation. Uh, for example, in, in related to payments or identity that they are starting to move the projects that they were working on that to move really fast. So in your opinion, which trends are going to be accelerated due, during, uh, due to COVID-19? So definitely, uh, I would say uh, remote shopping would be accelerated. Uh, remote banking, um, if you think about it, banks had to change their methods of work. In some banks, you had to sit in front of, of the bank officer to sign documents. And today, if they would force it, we couldn't move the economy. So a lot of regulatory changes in, in signing documents and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. make processes much quicker over the web. Uh, it also going to drive uh, cybersecurity uh, much farther because now we're way more dependent on the uh, 
uh, availability of the service and the, you know the quality and and the uh, security of the services that uh, we're having. Uh, so cybersecurity will get a huge push as well. Mm. We are we are seeing here in Europe how we need like a digital infrastructure that that before it was more. Uh, we were working with companies from the States, companies from Israel, companies from, from China, companies, but, but now there is a need to build a European digital infrastructure. And I think that this is going to be an important uh, push here in, in Europe, but let's, let's see how, how this evolves. So mm -hmm. going back to, to MoveIt and your role as CEO, I... Uh, I think I know why I admire you in many ways, but what has impacted me most about MoveIt is the culture. So it's uh, the commitment of the team uh, with like very always with a clear definition of the goals and, and very high output. So how have you built, or have you helped building that culture? So what tips do you have to build the right team and the right culture in a tech startup it's it's a it's one of these very important but soft questions i mean when you look at companies you ask about the culture sometimes it's very difficult to provide a clear answer to what makes a company different from another one um, my personal belief you know after starting three companies is that it's all about um you know the the leadership Uh, what's the management team, the CEO and the management team um, transmit to the other employees and it, it propagates down all the way since uh, I don't believe that people starts culture from, from the bottom. The culture starts from how the CEO behaves, how the management teams behave, how, um, how we react to situations, how we respect our customers. And when I built MoveIt, uh, it was actually a, a, all about building a culture that I feel comfortable to live with. So we set ourselves multiple um, uh, rules and uh, values. And it's not was just to put it on a poster in a conference room. We really tried to connect everything we do to the values that we have. And by the way, I want to share with you the, the first one was respect. We do respect our customers, we respect our users, we respect our suppliers. So if you respect, you have to respect everybody. We respect our employees. Uh, but respect doesn't mean that you, you're, you're not pushing to excellence. So that's another very important uh, um, uh, value that we, we try to add um, and, and focus on impact that we expect from our employees. And when you think about it, and another value, which is user first, I mean, we are a consumer app with 800 million users. If we wouldn't think of user first, we would never win. So once you decide about your values, you can't have 100. You have to put like five, six. Then you keep pushing these values and show, set example to the employees of how these values are coming to life you know, on a daily basis. It's a hard work and you don't see immediate results, but along the years, it becomes the culture of the company. And then when the management team are acting like that and they hire other people, the other people are hiring other people and the culture remains. Uh, and, and that's my philosophy about that. And, and it worked perfectly at Movie. It's not always successful. And my, my personal uh, experience and history shows that... Uh, You know, sometimes it can go to different directions, but it moved it. It was my company, my vision, and I, I insisted that this is something that everybody needs to do. And last thing about it, you must not be cynical about it because if you are, people immediately recognize it and they don't really respect what you're saying. So if you're not cynical and you're serious about these uh, uh, values, then people take it very seriously. Hmm. They need to be embedded in your actions. That's the the idea Absolutely. that if you you need to act about these values. So I don't know if you have read the book, the hard things about hard things. Is uh, Ben Horowitz <laughs> explaining his experience as an entrepreneur and CEO? So 
So I think for me, it's in the top three business books in my list because I, I think it's really amazing. And there is a very interesting chapter uh, called The Most Difficult CEO Skill and, and explains like the hardest thing it's managing your own psychology, like keep your mind in check, like how you keep your mind like calm. And, and he said always that, that, um, that often CEOs make one of the following two mistakes. One is they take things too personally or they don't take things personally enough. So that's, that's the balance that is really complicated to have because in the end, the things, things always go wrong when you are like in a start. They can be very good, but I'm sure that, that bad things happen during all the process. So, so you need to be like prepared for that and, and, and be in balance. What, so, what do you think is the most difficult CEO skill? So first, I, I, I really appreciate Ben Horowitz and I've met him several times and I think um, he's right in, in, in the aspect of uh, the spectrum of taking things personally or not taking. So I think you have to find yourself your balance. Most of the CEO, the successful CEOs that I'm familiar with, with are leaning towards taking things personally. Uh, otherwise, you know, you're you're just working as a robot. But for me, the most difficult CEO skill is the fact that there's very little share of responsibility. At the end of the day, it's you. And it's you and there's nothing behind you, not the board of directors, not your management team, which are great support, but you have to take decisions. But it, there are so many decisions that are binary. You go left or you go right. And the consequences are not clear because you take these decisions with a very limit, limited certainty. So the, the most difficult skills for CEOs is to analyze risks and do and make, take decisions in, in low certainty situations. The worst CEO just don't take decisions. Then it's a catastrophe. But when you have to take decisions, the skill is how to analyze the risks. You're not always going to be right. But if you can analyze it and take quick decisions and willing to make some quick mistakes and correct yourself, that's the most important skill for the CEO. And it goes towards hiring people, firing people, uh, signing contracts, make decisions about... Uh, let me give you an example. I mean, in, in this uh, acquisition, we, we did have a ready to sign investment for Movit that would give us years of financial freedom. And then came um, two offers to acquire the company and we didn't know if it will end up with a closure. And the decision was to put aside a very secured financial round that will give us a few years or get into a risky situation in, in a COVID-19 uh, situation where you can lose everything. And it wasn't an easy decision at all, not for me. And at the end of the day, when I came to my board of directors, they looked at me and, and said, Nir, what is your recommendation? So you are very alone in these situations, but the skill is to take quick decisions based on as much facts as you can collect. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a limited certainty uh, that you have. Okay, so I think we are approaching the end of the interview. I really appreciate your sharing your time, thoughts and ideas about all these things, both like urban mobility, but also your approach or your ideas about being a CEO, about managing people, which I think it's it's very interesting to to, to go even deeper, but we will we will do that in, in, in Tel Aviv one of these days. And I would like to, to close out with a final question about your motivations. So you are living a global startup which is implementing the future of mobility. Uncertainty is always embedded in, in your work and, and that's really challenging. So what drives you to be working on this space, on mobility, on technology? What are your main motivations? I think the main motivation here at Movit is the, the impact that we're making on so many people. Um, it's not the single email that we get thousands every day from people around the world that Movit, you saved my life, literally, because I didn't know how to get here or there. But the, the, the general impact on 
hundreds of millions of people, hopefully very soon on, on more than billion people. And uh, the ability to, by coming with new ideas, with, with new technology to change the way people are actually commuting, um, seems like a once in a lifetime opportunity to live a small dent on the history of, of something. And I think very, very few people were, were, were having this amazing opportunity and not taking this opportunity for me looks like uh, an amazing uh, loss of opportunity if I wouldn't do it. So I feel like I, I, I got a great chance and I'm trying to do my best not to disappoint myself and, and my team, but and, and to make it successful and really make a change. Uh, that drives me every day, every morning, every time I think about why am I doing this? It's, it's really interesting because everyone I'm, I'm asking this question that is working on mobility, I think we are all answering the same thing, that, which is impact. Because mobility in the end is something that is really important for people. It's having real impact on cities. So the, the driver of the transformation in our cities is mobility, is transportation. It's one of the key things that is going to, to move us to, to a new and different city, more sustainable uh, I think that that's that's the key, and and having a, a purpose that is, it's it's more than than our company itself. So it's something that that is going to 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 be a big impact in our cities, and and that's all all of the people. It's it's talking about this idea that that the impact of mobility and transportation. It's it's really really important. Okay, so thanks again for sharing your ideas and near and. Looking forward to see the success of Mobit, Mobili, and Intel uh, together. I hope we can see each other face to face soon. And I hope you have enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. And, and thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it and I was happy to do it. Okay. Thank you, Nir. Ciao.